Hey there, students. We are here for another uh, Corona class meeting. Okay, can't even get my first sentence out right. It's that quarantine, what it'll do to you. All right, so what am I sipping today? I'm sipping Shang Tea, uh, which is based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Shang Tea's Tangerine Blossom Red Tea, uh, which in China they call like what we call black tea. They call it red tea. So, you know, Shang calls it red tea. So when I'm drinking this, I'll call it red tea. Um, but Shang Tea is my favorite. So, yeah, that is what I'm sipping today and James good to see you there um, today's corona class is going to focus on the age of enlightenment okay so we're going to get into the age of enlightenment we're going to get into the uh, you know just anything to do with that will get priority of course I will take general exam questions as well now I also have something I don't think I'm going to discuss this today but I want to go ahead and make this available to those of you or who are with me in Crowdcast. Now, if you're on YouTube, feel free to join us in uh, in the Crowdcast stream. I will go ahead and put a link there. Okay, I'll go ahead and put a link to the Crowdcast stream so that y'all got it. Uh, you know, join us on Crowdcast. Okay, so I'm going to put the link if you want to interact with me. I'm going to check into the YouTube chat here and there. Okay, I'm going to check into the YouTube chat. Um, so we're going to uh, we're going to have that as an option. OK, so it is Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everyone. So with that. OK, so we're good there. And I'm going to go ahead and share a DBQ that I have created. I just made this in the middle of the night last night on enlightened absolutism. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and send that to those of you who are in the Crowdcast session. And if you want to take a stab at that, that's something that we're going to look at at some other time in another session. But I've got a finished DBQ on enlightened absolutism, on absolutism. OK, so that's uh, that's something that you might find useful. So again, Focus area is on the age of enlightenment. So we'll uh, we'll be getting into that. And that DBQ is available for those of us here in Crowdcast. All right. So let's go ahead and get to the questions. And remember, Corona class for AP Euro is streaming at one o'clock p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. OK, now, as far as next week, this week, we did the scientific revolution and the enlightenment. What are y'all thinking about for next week? Uh, let's think about some things for next week. Now, how did the glorious revolution relate to the enlightenment? OK, so Mark, you have a question about the glorious revolution and the enlightenment. So one thing that uh, that we get into here, and this was a DBQ a couple years ago, and that might be why y'all are asking this question, right? Um, so with that, you know, the French Revolution may not be a bad, uh, you know, a bad thing to do. Let's think about getting into the French Revolution. Uh, I think that that period might be a good thing to look at. I think I'm going to keep that in mind. So with that, how did the Glorious Revolution relate to the Enlightenment? Now, the Glorious Revolution, 1688, 1689, you know, at the end of, you know, they've got the English Civil War. Then they've got some more, uh, you know, beef between the Crown and Parliament. And so going from there, uh, going from there, uh, we see here that it's kind of awkwardly placed between the Reformation and the Enlightenment. The Reformation, the era of the Reformation ends in 1648. 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia. That is in 1648, we see with the Peace of Westphalia, uh, this is the last time that you will have a European war that is fought with religion as a primary motive. After 1648, we see a shift. Now, what we want to note here is 1648 is the end of the Thirty Years' War. 1649, that is when Charles I of England is beheaded. So the English Civil War is going on at the same time that the Thirty Years' War is in its bloodiest phase. And so this is the end of the Reformation. Now, when we look at the English Bill of Rights, we see a lot of things that are kind of like, you know, that are foreshadowing the Enlightenment, uh, setting the stage here. John Locke, when you look at my videos on the Enlightenment, I call like Locke and Newton kind of like precursors or godfathers or prophets of the Enlightenment. John Locke is somebody that certainly, I mean, he's somebody, he and Newton are laying the foundation for the Enlightenment. But at the same time, 
Locke and Newton are still very much steeped in 17th century or yeah, 17th century kind of thinking. For example, uh, you know, Newton spent a lot of time reading the Bible and trying to decode prophecies in the Bible, um, sketching out the dimensions of the Temple of Solomon. John Locke was a devout Christian. He actually uh, wrote a uh, you know, wrote an essay on the reasonableness of Christianity. So Locke and Newton are kind of situated, you know, they're still in that scientific revolution era. But what we want to note here is when we think about the idea of natural rights, okay, the idea of natural rights and the right of revolution, that the glorious revolution is setting up a lot of things here in terms of recognizing individual rights, uh, you know, recognizing limited government. Now, of course, when we look at, uh, you know, enlightened absolutism and republicanism, those are the two forms of government that we see during the age of enlightenment. And we start to see like really this idea that there should be an organization of government. Okay. So when you look at that, you know, parliament has these powers, the king cannot tax without the consent of parliament, uh, that people have a natural right, natural rights to life, liberty and property. So this whole idea of there being natural laws, of there being natural rights, these are all present in the glorious revolution in the English Bill of Rights. Um, and so the English Bill of Rights, you could see this is like almost like the opening shot of the Enlightenment. So the glorious revolution, it's like, you know, that's why the DBQ a few years ago asked, evaluate whether or not the glorious revolution was part of the enlightenment so when you go from uh, when you go from there uh, the glorious revolution was part of the enlightenment so with that uh, you know that's really kind of where that is it stands between uh, the reformation and the enlightenment because it also has stuff in there that basically like the monarch can't be catholic so when you look into the English Bill of Rights, there are also some things that are definitely not enlightened. When you think in those terms that we're not going to have a Catholic monarch in this country um, because that's just not something that we want. So you see there's definitely some religious bigotry um, in the English Bill of Rights that is not really compatible with the Enlightenment. So that's something that's important as well, that when we look at the Glorious Revolution, we can look at it as the last chapter of the Reformation or the first chapter in the Enlightenment or kind of like a middle chapter between the Reformation and the Enlightenment. Okay, so as far as that goes, uh, we've got some general questions about DDQs. That's probably something I'm gonna address in another, uh, another thing here. But what I want y'all to do is if you Google AP Euro LEQ, uh, or AP Euro LEQ rubric, you will see uh, a link to tomritchie.net and you can go here. Let me just go ahead and share my screen with you. Those of you who have questions about the DBQ, and I know that I need to do a dedicated broadcast on that. Okay, so let's think about a dedicated broadcast on that coming up. But if you go to Google and you go to just type in AP Euro LEQ rubric and then go to that second link there, First one's the college board. We won't worry about that. And, or actually, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. It's just really, uh, uh, yeah, not AP Euro LEQ, but DBQ. Okay. So AP Euro DB. Whoa, look at that. We are top. We are top, ladies and gentlemen. That's a big deal. Look at that. Oh, my goodness. I wonder if that shows up the same way for everybody. Uh, look at that AP Euro DBQ, and we'll get into uh, we'll get into that. So when you go to that, wow, people, um, I am flattered. So so we see here, I've got a rubric. I've got the Marco Learning Annotation and Setup Guide, okay? So that's something that I've got here to help y'all out. Now, my guess here, we don't know what's going to be a three, a four, and a five, but I can tell you with near absolute certainty that a six is going to be a passing score, okay? So I would say that I am 99.9% .9 certain that six points is going to be a passing score on the exam. 
eight points is going to be at least a four and possibly a five. Like, I think what's going to happen is a lot of the people who score nine and 10 points, these are going to be people who have extra time. Like what they're probably going to find out is that the people scoring nine and 10 points, these are people who are getting extra time. All right. So, so with that, uh, let's see, I'm trying to focus the screen here, but yeah, I think it likes the split screen there. So we'll just go ahead and let it. So when we look at this, we've got a strategy here. And again, this is on my AP Euro DDQ page. You can, you can download my rubric. You can download Marco's setup guide. You can also download sample responses to a DBQ that I designed on secularism and the Renaissance. Okay. So all of these resources are there for the DBQ. Um, sounds like people are requesting a video. I've heard you. We will get into that. So I think that you're looking at six points. It's going to be a passing score, eight points, a safe four, possibly a five, 10 points. Don't do it, Anakin. I have the high ground. Okay. Don't, I would not recommend trying this. I would not recommend trying that. So with that, that's what I'm looking at for the DBQ. Lots of resources there available on my website. Okay. So as far as that goes, I would say that you are looking at a safe, uh, you know, a six is going to be a safe passing score. Okay. And the Bernard factor, thanks for coming in, even though you're not uh, preparing for this. All right. So we're going to, you know, but, but I've got some, I've got some strategies there. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, we are going to get into the basic policies of enlightened absolutism. So I've got a video on enlightened absolutism, but let's go ahead and take a uh, take a look here. We will go into enlightened absolutism and go over the basic principles. OK, and that's, of course, what's being addressed in the DBQ that I've shared with those of you who are here in crowd. Cast. Okay, so let's take a look at enlightened absolutism. And let's share the screen. Okay, so we're going to share the screen and we're going to uh, go from there. So let's see, we are screen sharing and let's see, it's not going to let me focus the screen. I don't know why it is. Uh, I don't know why it is focusing for some reason, will it focus? But yeah, it's just not focusing the screens. Okay, so as far as that goes, enlightened absolutism, um, kind of like uh, Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. Okay, so there's another Star Wars reference for you. Now, toleration of religious minorities, reform of institutions, absolutism, of course, and patronage of the philosophes. Okay, so here are the things when we want to assess whether a, a monarch is an enlightened absolutist. First of all, toleration. Okay, so is there a religious toleration policy? If there's not a religious toleration policy, that's not enlightened. So when we think about this toleration of religious minorities, now also we want to think about does this enlightened monarch support separation of church and state? That's something that I think is important as well. Reform of institutions. Is there institutional reform? The strongest here, you're going to see Frederick the Great uh, is going to uh, reform you know, the civil service. Basically, Frederick the Great creates a civil service system where you've got a system of professionals who are running the government and not just somebody who is there because of whatever title they have. Now, granted, a lot of these people have titles, but civil service, that there is this professional administration of the government. Now, also, when you look at Joseph II, uh, who uh, issued an edict of toleration for Jews, also uh, Joseph II uh, was, uh, you know, got rid of some aspects of serfdom, or at least tried to. Now, absolutism, this is as opposed to republicanism. Okay, so the two the two types of government were actually maybe three that we see that that surface here are 
Republicanism, of course, that's when you look at the French Revolution, the American Revolution, you're looking at Republicanism. We also can see constitutional monarchy, as you see in Britain, and then enlightened absolutism. And then finally, patronage of the philosophes. So we're thinking in terms of there was a point where Voltaire uh, lived at Frederick the Great's palace for a few years. They eventually had a falling out, but Voltaire and Frederick. Uh, Frederick was very interested in philosophy. Catherine the Great was a patronage, patroness of the philosophes. Uh, she corresponded extensively with Diderot and Voltaire. Now, the three enlightened absolutists that you will run into the most would be Catherine II of Russia, Frederick II of Prussia, Joseph II of Austria. Now, Catherine and Frederick are both known as the Great. So Catherine the Great, Frederick the Great, and Joseph, I guess, the not so great, right? Because he's not known as Joseph the Great. Now, Joseph, one thing we want to know about Joseph is Joseph was the most ambitious in his reforms. Joseph tried to carry out some very extensive reforms in Austria, um, but he was also the least successful, okay? So when you look at Joseph II, okay, when we look at Joseph II of Austria, uh, we are finding that he's the most radical and the least effective, okay? So that's something that is important there. Now, he did issue a, uh, you know, religious policy that included toleration of private worship for Jews, like not just Christian toleration. So that's something that is important there as well. Now, Frederick the Great, as I was saying here, Frederick, now this is one thing, Frederick the Great of Prussia was a philosopher king, about as close as we can get to a philosopher king. Frederick the Great called himself the first servant of the state. Um, that's something that you want to note here in terms of the first servant of the state, that Frederick is uh, saying that the king's job is not to live in luxury. It is not to chase women. He says that you look at kings like, you know, I don't think he mentions Louis the 14th by name, but, you know, a king that's chasing women all the time and living in extreme luxury, that this king is not an effective ruler for his people. The king is there to serve. So Frederick philosophically is very much against, uh, you know, Louis the 14th and his way of doing things also, before he became king, Frederick wrote a, a pamphlet against Machiavelli because Frederick is saying, remember, Machiavelli is all about being amoral, okay? Machiavelli is about not having a moral uh, compass, okay? That you're basically doing whatever's effective. But Frederick says that a ruler needs to, uh, a ruler needs to have a moral compass, a ruler needs to think in terms of morality, needs to think in terms of his people. So that's something. Now, of course, there are some, some Machiavellian aspects about how Frederick ruled. So what we want to note here is when we're thinking about the enlightened absolutist, how enlightened were they? How absolute were they? That's something that is an open question. Now, Frederick, again, he did patronize uh, Voltaire. You can see here there's Voltaire um, at the table there with Frederick the Great. Uh, and so, you know, they he was a regular guest at his court. The relationship eventually soured. Now, Frederick was also known as the Potato King, okay? Frederick, now remember potatoes, uh, you know, taters. What's taters? Hopefully some of y'all seen Lord of the Rings. Uh, that... You know, Frederick the Great, uh, you know, potatoes, potatoes, you know, mash them, boil them, stick them in a stew. All right. If you haven't watched Lord of the Rings, great thing to do while you're on quarantine. Uh, but Frederick inspecting a potato harvest. The potatoes came to Europe from the Columbian Exchange. I always talk about potatoes and tomatoes when I'm talking about new world crops that are brought to Europe. Remember that before the Columbian Exchange, the French didn't have French fries. The Italians didn't have tomatoes. Like imagine Italian food with no tomatoes. I know that's mind blowing, but Italian food did not have tomatoes before the Columbia Exchange. Now, potatoes, even though we eat potatoes all the time, but when you think about it, when you look at like a raw potato, I mean, it's ugly, 
it doesn't have any taste. And we learned that you know, salt and butter make a big difference, right? Salt and butter and frying oil make a big difference. But without any of that stuff, potatoes are bland. Uh, they are ugly. A raw potato really can't. Uh, it's very, you, I've never tried to eat a raw potato. There's mixed stuff out there, whether they're even, you know, it's probably not even advisable to eat a raw potato. Now, Frederick knows that potatoes are a very efficient crop. Potatoes, like today, if you're on a diet, they tell you don't eat potatoes. And so with Frederick, you know, he knows that these are very nutrient rich. And so if he can get the Prussian people to go along with planting potatoes, then people will be better fed. They'll get a more efficient source of calories. And so Frederick was known by some as the potato king. And so there is Frederick, the ruler of Prussia, inspecting a potato harvest. Okay, so he's there inspecting that potato harvest. So going from uh, going from that, that Frederick was the one who brought this into Germany. And again, civil service reform. So he reformed the Prussian bureaucracy, and now men of non-noble birth can receive government posts, okay? And so that is what we know as meritocracy. This is where we have, uh, you know, people of merit are getting in jobs and not just people who have titles of nobility. The other thing here is that Frederick expanded religious toleration. Now, similar, though, to some other countries, uh, you do see that uh, Protestants were still favored for key government posts. Um, there were very few Catholics in Prussia. Most of the Catholics in Germany today are in southern Germany. Catholics in northern Germany are a religious minority. So with that, when we're looking at the enlightened absolutists, remember, we're looking for toleration of religious minorities, reform of institutions, absolutism and patronage of the philosophes. Okay, those are the things that we're looking at here. Now, um, expanding the screen now, uh, Viviki, uh, you are asking here, is the PowerPoint on my website? Uh, yeah, I know, but what the thing is that the screen share, it's not letting me emphasize a window right now for whatever reason, so sorry about that. Now, I do have, y'all are asking about the slides. Viviki's asking about the slides. Uh, that I have a lecture, I have an actual proper lecture on enlightened absolutism, okay? So with that, then we get into the key people of the enlightenment, okay? Some of the philosophes, so Voltaire, Montesquieu, Rousseau. So as far as when we're looking at this, now this is uh, this is one of those things. Oh, the screen became tiny again. Okay, so as far as that, let me go ahead and uh, and open up my presentation on the philosophes, and let's see what's going on. I'll pay some attention to the chat uh, as we go through this. Now, I've got lectures on all of these people that you're asking about. Okay, so keep that in mind that I've got I've got a full series of lectures on the Enlightenment philosophes. Oh, okay, so we've got the tiny screen over there. So we're gonna try to focus this. Okay, now we're good, now we're good. I think we're good now, and I'll come check the chat again to make sure, okay? So with that, yeah, so, and now I should be tiny. Okay, so y'all tell me what's going on now. How does this look? Okay, so let's go ahead and make sure that everything is good here. Okay, is everything working? Let's go into the chat. We're all good. Okay, so we're going to uh, just go in here and see what's uh, see what's happening. Okay, so when we go into the philosophes, okay. Now, first of all, philosophe is not a misspelling. That is French for philosopher. So typically when we talk about the Enlightenment, uh, the Enlightenment folks, we are using the term philosophe equals Enlightenment philosopher because it's French for the word philosophe. Now, I've noted already, and again, I've got a very substantial series of lectures on this. Newton and Locke are basically the precursors. They're the people who are kind of the godfathers of the Renaissance. Newton with the laws of physics and natural, the idea of natural law, John Locke with the idea of natural rights, okay? And of course, again, you can ask questions like, was Locke part of the Enlightenment? Now, we can see that the Enlightenment's going on all around Europe, but especially in France, okay? Now, I've also got a video about the American Enlightenment, 
Uh, but uh, here I've got, you know, we see that most of these folks, Voltaire, Diderot, Montesquieu, Rousseau, they are coming from France. So we want to note that France is the epicenter of the Enlightenment, part of the reason why we uh, call it, uh, call them philosophes, right? And so Voltaire is the most important of these, the most visible of these Enlightenment philosophes, of course, best known for writing Candide, which he considered to be a minor work. OK, this is something that didn't take him a lot of time. He didn't put a lot of energy into compared to a lot of his other writings, such as extensive biographies of Louis the 14th and Peter the Great. Uh, these are things that, you know, he spent a lot of time uh, doing. But at the end of the day, he is most famous for writing his, uh, you know, his short, you know, what is one of his shorter works here. Uh, and it's a brilliant book. I mean, I recommend this to every AP Euro student. And so with that, when we look at notable works, his letters on England, which he wrote in exile uh, when he was young, he was exiled to England for a certain amount of time, his philosophical dictionary, his elements of Newton's philosophy, even though he was a man of letters, he really tried to understand Newton. Uh, Voltaire, something of a popularizer, that he spread scientific ideas beyond the scientific community. And remember that that's part of the that's part of what differentiates the Enlightenment from the scientific revolution is that. In the scientific revolution, like Sir Francis Bacon, for example, Sir Francis Bacon is thinking in terms of like, I just want to do experiments. I want to do the scientific method. I'm not out to revolutionize society. I just want to learn. OK, whereas in the Enlightenment, it's more about applying scientific principles to society, to government, to uh, to the everyday. And so we see here, there is Voltaire trying to write his book on Newton's, uh, Newton's philosophy. He's not a scientist, but he did know a woman who was a scientist. Emily du Chatelet was uh, a French mathematician, physicist, and author, and uh, was a very close friend of Voltaire uh, for, you know, a one-time mistress. They were, uh, they actually lived in a chateau um, out, uh, you know, out in the countryside together for quite a long time. So, you know, they did have a, a beautiful uh, relationship. There's a book that I read uh, a while back about that called Passionate Minds. It was a wonderful book. Um, so uh, Voltaire talked about Chatelet. He said of her, uh, she was a great man whose only fault was being a woman. Um, what she say, what he's saying here is if she had been a man, then she would have been somebody who was universally recognized for her accomplishments. And uh, instead, she was a woman who didn't get noticed nearly as much as she deserved. So, you know, she acted here as Voltaire's muse. Now, the biggest thing you want to know about Vol you want to know about Voltaire is that he was an advocate of religious toleration. He was anti-clerical. He was a critic of Christianity. Um, of any revealed religion, especially the Catholic Church in France. So he was an advocate of religious toleration. We also want to note that Voltaire was an advocate of the religion of deism, what we would know as a natural religion. I've got a video on deism as well. So all of this is fleshed out a bit more in my video on Voltaire. And We've got a video on deism as well. This idea of a religion that doesn't have sacred texts, that it's just like, I believe in God. I believe that God created. I believe that God is rational and has good intentions. That is deism. And that God doesn't really interfere that much with things like miracles, okay? Which miracles, we've got to think about why did the Enlightenment philosophes not like miracles? Well, miracles are suspensions of natural law. Like when we see things in the, uh, when we see things happen in the Bible where that's a miracle, we see a suspension of natural law. And so that's a good question. I'm not sure if Voltaire spread the myth about an apple falling on Newton's head. Not sure about that at all. Uh, so with that, uh, it's interesting. It looks like, uh, you know, the YouTube stream actually has a little bit of a different angle on the camera, like a wider angle than the Snapchat stream. Uh, not not Snapchat, uh, which Snapchat's Tom Ritchie SC. If anybody wants to add me, I probably won't add you back. But, you know, you can see what I'm up to. Uh, so with that, uh, let's see. So uh, 
going on from Voltaire, okay, Rousseau is also, uh, let's see, so, so uh, yeah, Snapchat stream, that didn't make any sense, did it, Mark? So then going from there, okay, Montesquieu and Rousseau, let's go ahead and get, uh, and get back into this, okay? And so uh, Ava, remind me on Instagram, okay? Find me on Instagram, remind me that you're part of the Crowdcast gang, okay? So find me on Instagram, remind me that you're part of the Crowdcast gang. Uh, leave a comment on a recent, uh, on a recent post. In fact, let me run in here and uh, I need to grab my, grab my phone real quick. I've got it over here on the charger and let me get in here and... All right, let's see. Uh, all right, so I'll shout out anybody that follows me on Instagram at Tom Ritchie. I'll go ahead and shout out. Most of y'all are following me already. I know Vicky is following uh, D -D 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 Dora. Uh, so, okay, so going into that, let me just see if I've got any uh, any new folks here. So now we're screen sharing. Let's go ahead. And we've had questions about Montesquieu and Rousseau. Diderot is also one of my favorites. Okay. Diderot, who is one of the primary editors of the encyclopedia. Um, we've got, uh, let's see, is this uh, the same? Uh, let's see. Okay. Zach Attack. And we've got Ellie, okay, who has recently followed. Okay. Thank you so much. And hello, James. Okay. Oh, we've got Mr. Frank, Anna, Logan. Ava just started following. Ava, you weren't following me already. I'm uh, I'm hurt. I'm hurt. All right. So uh, Ava, Logan, Anna, and Elizabeth, and Mr. Frank. Thank y'all so much. All right. So going from uh, going from there. Thank y'all so much for uh, the support here. So uh, with that, Diderot, one of the primary authors of the encyclopedia. Now, what the encyclopedia, uh, you know, what the encyclopedia, why that's significant. OK, when we think about why is the encyclopedia significant, um, we're thinking in terms of, uh, you know, that this is a source of information that is not controlled by government authorities. You know, this is like church authorities, state authorities. And that's why the French government actually tried to put a lid on it. Um, so with that, the encyclopedia was a major thing in terms of, um, you know, really getting into this whole idea of the marketplace of ideas. One of the things when we think about the Enlightenment and classical liberalism is that information has to flow. And information has to flow and the government shouldn't have control over it, okay? So note uh, one thing that's been very interesting to me to go ahead and apply this to like current events is when we think about like the government has been giving us statistics, the government and the media have been giving us detailed statistics about coronavirus deaths. But you notice, do y'all notice that they're not giving us any further information? Like we're not, it's very difficult if it's even possible to find like specific breakdowns. Like, you know, what's, uh, you know, what's the demographic information on the people who are dying, the people who are recovering? Uh, what's going on here? You think about in some countries, it's easier to find testing than others. In the United States, it is very difficult to get tested for Corona. It's not easy to get information right now. So you think about this freedom, part of freedom is freedom of information so that you can make rational judgments. When people don't have information, think about this. A lot of people are panicked right now. And so when we think about this, why are people so panicked? A Lauren who just got here, um, a lot of people are panicked uh, during this coronavirus crisis because they don't have good information. And so when we see this, uh, we can kind of see what was so revolutionary about the encyclopedia. What was revolutionary was here is a better source of information. Here's a source of information that's not controlled by the government and or by the church. So you're getting something that is not under control. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, we're going to uh, we're going to get into. Let's see. We're we're straight. We're sharing our screen, and that's Diderot. 
Okay, that's Diderot. And so with that, let's see. So going from uh, going from Diderot, we want to close unnecessary things here. All right. And so Diderot, also a poet, all kinds of other great stuff that I've got there. And then I go into uh, Expecto Patronum, OK, which, uh, you know, Catherine the Great was a Patronus or a Patrona, whatever you'd call her. She was a, uh, you know, a patroness, not a Patronus, but a patroness. Um, of the Philosophes. And so we know that uh, Catherine the Great, when she found out that Dennis Diderot was having a hard time financially, she purchased his library. So she gives him money to buy his library. And then she says, I'm going to pay you a salary to be my librarian. So basically I have bought your books and then I'm going to pay you to tend to your my, your slash my books. And at one point, Diderot uh, went and visited Catherine the Great. I think complained about her, uh, you know, slapping his thigh like to like she would laugh and then she'd like slap his thigh. And he was like, it hurts like she slaps hard. And, uh, you know, she's uh, the Empress of Russia and she's giving me money. So I can't really complain about that. Uh, so as far as uh, as far as that. So going from uh, going from there. Uh, We've got here political theory. Okay, so Montesquieu and Rousseau are the political theorists of the. Uh, they're the political theorists of the Enlightenment. And so when we look at Montesquieu, the spirit of the laws. He wrote the book, The Spirit of the Laws, where he goes into government based on Enlightenment principles. Now, one of the things that he brings in is this idea of what is the way to set up a Republican government like we saw under the Romans. And so he outlines this idea of separation of powers between the legislative, the executive and judicial branches that we need a separation of powers. And then when you look here, the legislative makes the laws, the executive enforces the laws, the judicial judges disputes. And so what we see here, the person who makes the laws is not the same person who enforces them. The person who enforces them, not the same person who judges if there's a dispute. So this keeps any one group from getting too powerful. And this goes into a lot of Enlightenment philosophes views of human nature, which are that, you know, humans are inherently selfish. They're inherently greedy. Like when we call people selfish and greedy, we're really just calling them humans. And so the Enlightenment is not about an attempt to apply some sort of religious or socialist morality, but to use people as they are and come up with institutions that will support that behavior. And so when we think about this, that we're, you know, Montesquieu is creating a government, he's creating a form of government um, where you don't depend on people to be good people. Okay, so I've got, uh, actually, I've got another Ava here. Okay, so we've got another Ava here from the stream. So we've got multiple um, Avas. Okay, so going from, uh, going from there, Cangelo, um, Baroque Classical, JPH, Palmer 57, Palmer Bank 57, Dale 360, Bum Mike. Okay, excellent, excellent. And look here. Okay, so, uh, you know, Talia is here as well. Okay, Talia, who is uh, into uh, into Star Wars. So excellent. Uh, has great uh, taste in Star Wars movies. Okay, so as far as that goes, uh, great to see people, uh, you know, getting into here. Now, so Montesquieu is using jealousy, like essentially that people need to be jealous of each other's powers. If you apply that to what's going on right now, if you want to understand Montesquieu, you can even look at checks and balances between the federal and the state governments. You see that President Trump has clashed with quite a few state governors over the uh, corona response. And so with that, we see that a lot of state governors are clashing with the president and you see this kind of standoff here and that's what Montesquieu wanted. Okay, Montesquieu wanted there to be jealousy, there to be checks and balances. So checks and balances such as a presidential veto. And so, and remember that empiricism, this is something that's a big deal in the enlightenment, just like in the scientific revolution. Okay. So as far as that goes, that that is just like the scientific revolution in the sense that we're doing things based on what we see. 
So we're not, uh, you know, we're not doing things based on what should be, but we're doing things based on what is, okay? We're doing things based on what is, not what should be. And so going from, uh, going from there, we look at Rousseau. Now, when we look at, when we look at uh, Montesquieu, we're looking at how should a government be organized? What is the best way um, for a government to be organized? Now, Rousseau is writing about what is the best way for a government to be legitimate, okay? What makes a government legitimate? And so with that, uh, you know, this uh, Rousseau's book, The Social Contract, now note that just because Rousseau wrote a book titled The Social Contract, it doesn't mean that he is the first person to address the idea of the social contract. Hobbes and Locke in the 17th century had addressed the idea of the social contract. So Rousseau, he titles his book, The Social Contract, but it's different than Locke. Now, there are three videos on YouTube that I would especially recommend. There is, uh, what does Locke say? That's Mr. Betts' class. And then what does, uh, I mean, what does John Locke say? That's Mr. Betts' class. Um, that is, then you've got uh, my video, What Does Thomas Hobbes Say? And then um, there is another video that was like uh, an acoustic song that I think was really great. Uh, you know, What Does Rousseau Say? Okay, so What Does Rousseau Say? I love this one. Okay, so let me just go ahead and note that. Uh, yeah, that was a while back, uh, Mr. Uh, Maintz's class. I haven't heard from him in a while, but this is a great video here. Uh, what does Rousseau say? I'm going to go ahead and link that both in the YouTube chat uh, and also in uh, in the Crowdcast chat. So thank y'all for those of y'all who are in both places. Um, but this uh, this thing, what does Rousseau say? I really enjoy it. Um, because it goes into his uh, goes into his philosophy, uh, which is a lot of times kind of difficult to uh, to take in. Rousseau is not someone who is, uh, you know, someone. Yeah, y'all feel free to follow my SoundCloud. Just search for Google Tom Ritchie SoundCloud and you'll find it, including my new song about Napoleon, which I guess I'll sing live for y'all again when we are uh, when we're live together. So thank y'all for y'all support of my musical endeavors on SoundCloud, even though they're not that serious. All right. So let's make sure that we're emphasizing this here. And now we're going into Rousseau. OK, so now Rousseau, um, the social contract peaks early. The first line of the book says man is born free, but everywhere he is in chains. And that's the first line of the book, the most often quoted. And so he's asking what makes a government legitimate. Now, where is Locke's, whereas Locke's social contract, you know, we don't learn about Rousseau in American government classes, okay? We don't really learn about Rousseau in American government because his social contract is not individualistic, okay? So it's really, it's based on this idea of the general will. Thank you so much, uh, Audrey, you weren't following me already. I thought you were already following. I think you might have unfollowed and followed back just to get a shout out from me or something like that, because I swear I've seen this. Uh, I swear I've seen this account at some point uh, before. Um, but uh, there you go. So uh, Mac is here and Melon's uh, um, Zadami 10. OK, so we've got that as well. Thank you all for the follows on Instagram. And so uh, so with that, uh, we've got, uh, let's see, just need to make sure I'm getting everybody. OK, so the general will. So the idea here is if you are not in the majority, OK, you are not in the majority. The vast majority feels differently than you do about something then you need to submit to the general will. And so as far as this goes, this is something that's kind of interesting because, again, I think there are a lot of ties to this current like coronavirus crisis. Like we see two groups of people uh, when we look at the responses here to corona. That one group of people supports the most prohibitive measures possible. OK, and we're thinking here, what is freedom? Now, Rousseau defines freedom as submission to the general will. So when we think about Locke versus Rousseau, let's think about this with the corona. All right. So first of all, you've got people who are more into like Locke's version of the social contract that basically like, OK, 
So there's a pandemic out there. Thank you, government, for letting me know. I will figure out how I want to respond to this personally. Now, when we think about this, so for example, if I am a, you know, a barber or, you know, a lash tech or something like that, that'd be, that'd be an interesting job for me, wouldn't it? Uh, that I'm giving people lashes and stuff like that. But as far as that goes, that, uh, you know, if I have a one-on-one -on -one business, like I'm a barber and I cut hair, I see one client. Now, the thing about a barber is I cut hair, but I see one client at a time. So it's a close contact profession, but at the same time, one person at a time. There are no more than two people there in that transaction. And so is the barber necessarily, okay? Here's, let me go ahead and put a poll out there. Let me go ahead and put a poll out there. Um, should a barber, okay, so should a barber um, be able to see, you know, to, uh, to do business, okay? So do business right now with one client at a time um with other clients waiting in the car okay in their vehicles okay similar to like a doctor's office okay yes and no okay so i want to see what y'all say about this you know do you think that a barber should be able right now to decide that they're going to do business like somebody again on one hand it's close contact on the other hand, it's one-on-one -on -one close contact. So we see some, this is interesting, okay? So we're seeing here that, oh, okay, the net, okay, it looks like the nose got here, okay? So yeah, it's impossible, y'all are noting, to cut hair with social distancing, okay? It's very difficult to cut hair with social distancing. And so with that, Strawberry has a very um, clear opinion on this. This is very interesting here. Uh, now, what I'm concerned about is not what I'm concerned about right now is, okay, now this is interesting. The no's are getting much more uh, into it now. At first, I think that we see the yeses felt very strongly. Cut your own hair. Okay, that's okay. So here's the thing, though. If we're looking at this as locks social contract, okay? So as far as that, uh, as that goes, when we think about lock social contract, uh, then we're thinking in terms of, let's see here. Uh, all right. So as far as that goes, we've got lock social contract, which you would think I've got a right to life, liberty, and property. Uh, so life, liberty, and property or life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. So life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So I've got, if I'm thinking about locks control, you know, lock social contract, that's my property. That's my business. I have a right to pursue happiness. I have a right to employment. That's my right. Now, what we see here is pretty consistent with the country as a whole now that we've got about 70% of you, 73% of you say that a barber should not be able to do business right now because of the close contact. Okay. So as far as that goes, what we see here is the yeses, you're more in line with Locke's version of the social contract that like, look, that's my, that's my business, whether I choose to do that or not. Now, Rousseau's social contract says that those seven of you who said yes, okay, and, and I'm with you, those seven of you that say yes, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you. I think that somebody who does, uh, who owns a business, uh, you know, it's just they shouldn't be forced to be dependent on the government right now and told not to work. That's my personal opinion. Now, in the in the context of the Enlightenment, I am free to put my personal opinion out there and it's not hurting anybody for me to say that, for me to say that someone who is who has a one on one business should be able to do their business. But now here's the thing. Rousseau's social contract, okay? Rousseau's social contract says, look, almost three quarters of the population says that the barber shouldn't be able to do business, that the, the barber, the, uh, the hairstylist, the lash tech, they don't need to do business right now. So basically the barber, the hairstylist, and the lash tech, they're having to stay home and they're waiting on their truck check because the general will says, we don't want you working right now. So for Rousseau, freedom is just submitting to the general will and saying that, all right. 
Now, see, I'm lucky because, you know, I'm a teacher, first of all, and then I've got an online business. So I'm not really impacted. If anything, I'm doing, you know, I'm, I may be doing a little better than I'd normally do as far as my tutoring business. Um, but, you know, but the thing is that Rousseau's idea of the general will, it's that basically if the vast majority says one thing, then what happens is that everybody has to go along with that. Okay. Everybody has to go along with that. So James, you are, you know, you're somebody who's typically <coughs> in my A push streams. And so you're, you're thinking in terms of that, you know, lock social contract, but for Rousseau, that's what we have to understand. The general will. Now, now here's the thing. Some barbers may decide they don't want to work right now. OK, but, you know, I was actually talking to somebody yesterday who is not only not able to work, but unable to like they're they're expected to support their parents. OK, so it's like their parents can't work. And if this person were able to work, not only could they support themselves, but also their parents who are depending on. them. And so this is something that uh, thank you. all I'm going to grab a tissue real quick. Y'all wash your hands. OK, I'm going to grab a tissue real quick. So for Rousseau, okay, for Rousseau, we think about this that, uh, you know, well, yeah, well, that, that's the thing, Steve, that, that when you're looking at Rousseau, that the social contract is made based on, I mean, like you're saying here, for example, what if the general will was in favor of slavery? Well, that's the general will. And that is, so think about this. When we look at the French Revolution, a lot of people were sent to the guillotine. The general will said, emigres to the guillotine. Now, should that emigre have gone to the guillotine and lost their life just because they tried, excuse me, they tried to get out of revolutionary France? I don't think so, but the general will said that. And so when we look at the reign of terror, it was very much influenced by this idea of the general will, that your individual rights are not as important as what the vast majority believes, okay? So, yeah, now here's the thing. That's that's something that's important here. As we go into that, Avery, what we want to note here is that when we're looking at the general will, yeah, the general will is not always going to be moral. It's not always going to be best. But Rousseau is basically, I call Rousseau sometimes not a socialist, but a proto-socialist, like somebody who has got some, some ideas that are going to get into socialism that basically, but really, or what you might call radical democracy. When we look at radical democracy, like for example, the United States isn't a democracy per se. Like we are not a radical democracy because we have a constitution that protects certain rights, okay? We have a constitution that protects certain rights. And so with that, we are not a radical democracy, that in our country, the Constitution is what speaks first, okay? The Constitution is uh, more important than the will of the majority. And the only way to amend the Constitution is to go through a process of two thirds of both houses of Congress, then we are going to send that to the states to see that there is almost unanimous consent there. Okay. But you know, that's our government. Our government says the constitution and individual rights come first, at least most of the time. But the Rousseau says it's the general will. Now, the other thing about that. Okay. The other thing is, oh, y'all are, yeah, we're catching uh, Nana up right? or Kofi. Yeah. Kofi's here. All right. Welcome back, Kofi. We always like to see you here. And so with that, now also, I want to let y'all know, I'm going to, I'm planning on doing a Euro stream. Some people were talking about, what about a stream as far as how to put together a DBQ? Um, I'm going to be streaming on Marco Learning's YouTube channel. So if anybody is not already subscribing to Marco Learning's YouTube channel, let's make sure that, uh, let's see, 
uh, almost, oh, great. Y'all like the Enlightenment rap. Yes, I do have a rap here on YouTube and on my SoundCloud and Enlightenment rap. So I've got Marco Learning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be streaming on their channel um, on Saturday evening. So if you want to get a notification of that, you need to go to this link that I just pressed, youtube.com slash Marco Learning. Okay, we just passed a thousand subscribers yesterday. There are also some great review videos here. There is a playlist of review videos. So we've got AP European history review videos here that is, uh, that's going to be important. Okay. These are going to be great helps to you. So go to Marco Learning's YouTube channel. We've got some really great stuff there waiting for you. Okay. So that's something that you want to make sure that you are subscribed to. Let's see if some of y'all are subscribing. We got 1.06. Um, hopefully we can get that um, up a little bit. I think a lot of y'all are probably already subscribed, but I am going to be broadcasting on that channel on Saturday evening. So make sure that y'all are subscribed to Marco Learning's YouTube channel. All right. So with that, that is Rousseau. So we've gone through the uh, the philosophes. Okay. Um, we'll talk about that on, on some level, Mark. I think it would be, I don't know if I'll do it on my channel or on Marco's channel, but I will do something like an introduction to religion. All right. So in general, I think here, Elliot, when we're talking about POV on a website, or I mean, not POV on a website, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So when we're talking about a POV, um, I think that, you know, it needs to be some, I mean, the main thing here is if you've impeached the author's credibility, they're not so much going to go into, did that directly support the argument? Now, the thing is, when you impeach the, you know, when when we impeach, when we think about this, uh, that when you impeach the author's credibility, you typically do it to support your argument. Or if you provide something. So, for example, let's go to my, you know, to my DBQ on on um, the Renaissance, on secularism and the Renaissance. Okay, so let's take a look at my DBQ on secularism and the Renaissance. And it looks like a few of y'all did subscribe to Marco Learning. Excellent, excellent. So going from there, let me open up my DBQ on secularism and the Renaissance and show you how we would do this. Okay, how we would use POV and or and again the enlightened absolutism DBQ that I that I shared earlier, um, which I can share again here for those of you who've just joined us. I'm not going to talk about this one today because I want y'all to have a chance to do it. I want teachers that I'm going to send this to to have a chance to assign it. But I'll go ahead and we'll talk from my Renaissance, uh, you know, DBQ. So with that, I've just shared uh, the. Enlightened Absolutism DBQ again. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and open up my DBQ on secularism and the Renaissance. So when we think about this, it should in some way help your argument. Okay, so so here's the thing that here's where like putting in some historical context or something like that um, is typically going to serve my argument. So for example here, evaluate whether the Renaissance was influenced primarily by Christian or by secular ideals. Now, if I want to argue, if I'm choosing to argue uh, an evidence-based argument, a defensible argument that the Renaissance was chiefly about secularism, well, document one, okay, we see here, Petrarch is writing a poem. Virgin, so lovely, clothed in the sun's light and crowned with stars, so pleased the highest sun that inside you he chose to hide his light. Uh, that we see virgin so pure and perfect in all ways, mother and daughter, both of your own child. I'm like double fisting here. I got tea and water. Who brighten this life and adorn the other. Through you, your son, son of the highest father, O shining lofty window, lofty window of the heavens, came down to save us in the final days. And you among all earthly dwelling places he chose, and only you. Well, it's evident, or it should be evident, he's writing a poem to the Virgin Mary. This is a religious poem, okay? So when we think about this, this is a religious poem. 
I'd like to note that the Renaissance was motivated by secular ideals chiefly. Well, if I'm making that argument, I want to put it into this argument, then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say this particular poem was religious, but most of Petrarch's writing was inspired by the classical, uh, you know, the classical Roman tradition. So we could take uh, we could take Petrarch's discovery of Cicero's letters, his own letters that he wrote to Cicero. We could look at his epic poem, Africa, which was about Scipio Africanus. So what I what I would use here for historical context, I would say that, yes, Petrarch wrote a religious poem. But if we know a lot about Petrarch, we might note that the Canzoneri, uh, even though this one, it's the last poem in the Canzoneri, he writes it to the Virgin Mary. Most of these poems are written to Laura. So this is where we would bring in something like that, where we're using this to support our argument that I say, look, document one is clearly religious, but here's a little something else that we need to take into account about Petrarch to give some more context so that we understand that the Renaissance was driven by by secularism okay so so when you get into that and then of course with this one if you know thomas more it looks like here he is uh interesting okay so thomas more is you know an english humanist northern humanism writing in utopia now at face value what we see here is he's advocating religious toleration so we would use, you know, we would say here, well, this is a secular idea, religious toleration, but we could also note that Moore was a Northern Renaissance writer. And we know that no the Northern Renaissance focused more on Christianity. And we could interpret this in the sense that Moore's calling for religious toleration. We could say, well, Thomas Moore, what's going on here is when Moore calls for, for religious toleration, he's really just asking Christians to actually act like Christians is what he's asking. So with that, we're going to go into these things in terms of looking at, uh, you know, so, so now sometimes you'll impeach the author's credibility with their point of view, but you'll do so usually to substantiate your argument. And that's something that I can go into for document one. There's definitely a strategy for that um, for document one in the Enlightened Absolutism DBQ that I just that I just shared. Okay. So with that, uh, it's okay. So I am going to, you know what, Francis, I'm going to be creating um, Corona class sessions. Um, I'm going to cr be creating those. I'll get those out there. Okay. So there will be more Corona classes Monday and Wednesday at one o'clock. They're not on the schedule yet, but they will be. Corona class will be Monday and Wednesday at one o'clock PM Eastern. Now there will be other times that I will be streaming, but those will be the official Corona class times. So yes, this is not the last Corona class session. Um, are the philosophes the earliest libertarians? Now it depends here, James. Uh, we could say that certainly like Diderot would be a great example of a libertarian. He wrote a poem, um, El, uh, El Ather El uh, which is basically like the fanatic for liberty. Now, here's the thing, though, just like with the founding fathers, we don't want to profile all of them and put them in one box. Rousseau certainly was not a libertarian. Uh, you know, when we think about the general will, that is not a libertarian concept. OK, not a libertarian concept. Now. Rousseau is, and, and that's another thing, thinking of, uh, speaking of Rousseau, Suho has got some uh, Van Gogh there, it looks like, in your profile picture, great Euro stuff there, um, that Rousseau, they say here that Rousseau is part enlightenment, part romantic, okay? And one of the things here is Rousseau was caught up in the idealization of the noble savage. Um, and also, we have to think about that Rousseau's social contract is not liberal. OK, and the Enlightenment that really the Enlightenment and classical liberalism go hand in hand. OK, um, so as far as that, uh, you know, yes, thank you so much. It's TL. I'm glad to see uh, the nice words here. And so the Enlightenment, most of the Enlightenment philosophes are advocating for some form of liberalism. So if you look at Voltaire and Diderot, definitely liberal in their thinking 
Adam Smith economic liberalism. Remember to put Adam Smith into the context of the Enlightenment. And then you've got Rousseau, do the do 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 general will, y'all. That is that's not really in line with what a lot of the Enlightenment philosophes are doing. So understand that while Rousseau is considered to be a philosopher, he does kind of fit in his own category. Um, so with that, um, that okay, so we've got here a great question about contextualization. But Vicky, it is always so good to see you. And um, the eight point strategy, how much time should we spend on contextualization? Remember, if you're using the eight point strategy in the uh, in the Marco learning handout that is available on my uh, DBQ page. OK, when we look at this, uh, you know, the uh, you know, when we look at the eight point strategy, what we want to note here is you do your contextualization last. OK, so I would score. We've got the points listed in the order we have them listed that you should basically do contextualization with the time that remains. And typically my thoughts on contextualization are that we need three good content rich sentences okay that address background and by content rich i mean they need to have some specifics okay they need to have some specifics along those lines as well um so Viviki, i uh, make sure that uh if we're still confused you're a big instagram supporter um feel free to let me know if you have any other questions all right so uh so going from uh going from there um we've got uh we've got some folks uh some folks following and it looks like uh we've got a new follower here jenny foster we've got cody uh rachel and frog Remy. all right so we've got uh, got some new followers Thank Thank you so much for those of y'all um, giving me support on Instagram. All right. So going from there, yeah, I would say the main thing is write your thesis statement, do your body paragraphs, and as time allows, go back to contextualization. All right. So with that, women's roles in the Enlightenment. Now, what we want to understand is that the Enlightenment was not a feminist movement, um, but it was the beginning of feminist movements. Now, first of all, we want to note the roles of women um, that are the roles of women who are organizing salons. OK, so women were playing a big role in putting together these social gatherings. And what this did, this put women in control of some of the ideas that were expressed. So basically, like someone like Martin, Madame, uh, Madame, Madame, uh, you know, Madam, I'll just say Madam, right? So uh, Madam Geoffrey, I believe would be her name. Um, you know, in French, it's probably something else, it's a type test, right? So, so with that, like if you wanted to be somebody, you needed to get an invitation to one of the more prestigious salons because that allowed you to connect, okay? So these women in deciding, these, these wealthy women who were deciding who is going to get invited to their salon, they are are deciding to decide who is going to get their ideas heard, who is going to be someone who gets to meet people. So that is being decided. So women are having some agency there. Now, we also want to note that Rousseau uh, was a big advocate of traditional thinking about women and men uh, in terms of, look, women and men are biologically different. They need different educations. They're made excuse me, they're made to occupy different spheres. So men and women, uh, you know, men need to be in the public sphere. Women need to be in the domestic sphere. So that's something Rousseau, certainly not a feminist. But we want to note the beginnings of the feminist movement during the French Revolution that were inspired by Enlightenment liberalism. Marie, uh, yeah, Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote uh, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen. And also we have, uh, you know, we have Olymp de Gouge who wrote uh, the, uh, you know, the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and the Female Citizen. So because of the Enlightenment, because we see the emphasis on the rights of man, we then go on to the rights of woman. All right. So with that, uh, you know, we've got all four points on the documents. Now, one, one thing that I'm going to note here. Uh, yeah, you only, that, that last document point, one thing I'm going to tell you, Daniel, don't do it, Eric. Okay, so I would not recommend trying to use all five documents. You notice that all I've got here, all I, the only place where I've got that point for using four documents argumentatively is on the 10-point strategy. 
I, there is a way to get eight points, which is a certain four, possibly a five, uh, without using more than three documents. You can use three documents and you can get eight points solid. Okay. So that's something that is, uh, that is very important here. Okay. So that's something that I think is important that I would not recommend trying to get that uh, four documents argumentatively point. Because what I've seen is with one of my tutoring clients, who's a great student, when my tutoring client tried to use all five documents, because remember, it'd be silly um, to use four because you mess one up, you miss the point. So when my client tried to use all five documents my client got sloppy with some other points and gave up some points so that's why i would recommend the six point and the eight point strategy i really don't recommend that 10 point strategy given that you've only got 45 minutes okay so with that did the enlightenment philosophes want re yeah so the thing is no the enlightenment philosophes weren't wanting revolutions because Oh, the, I'm sorry, the philosophes. I, I'm not, I was thinking about the enlightened absolutists. So it really depends, okay? It really depends on who it is. That certainly some of them would have, uh, you know, would have gone along with that. Whereas others, especially if somebody's an advocate of enlightened absolutism, they might not want that. So again, let's not put the philosophes all into one box together. All right. So as far as that goes, it definitely, uh, let's see, can I say EY? EY. All right. I just said EY. All right. So we need a VP for the Corona class. That's funny. What, um, who am I going to vote for? Not sure about that. We'll have to check on that. Um, so, so with that, thank y'all though, for, uh, all your stuff here. Kofi is uh, trying to get some politics started here. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, it's clear that I'm going to have to uh, do something that's addressing the DBQ in particular. So I will be looking into that. Now, some of y'all have subscribed to Marco Learning's YouTube channel. That's been great. I will be back. Monday and Wednesday, I will go ahead and put those on the schedule, even with times to be determined, just so there's no confusion. Monday and Wednesday at one o'clock p.m. Eastern, we will continue to offer Corona class sessions. Now, from what I'm hearing here, y'all want the French Revolution next week. We want to go into the French Revolution. Is that what I'm hearing? So let me uh, let me note here how much uh, we, you know, let's go ahead and get uh, a vote of the people, right? See what the general will is. Uh, what do we want to focus on next week? Okay, so week, the French Revolution, or another topic. Okay, now, because that could easily be two, like divided up into two. So let's go ahead and just make sure that I'm reading the room correctly, that y'all want to do the French Revolution, that I'm not hearing that wrong. Okay, so as far as that goes, okay, it looks like we are very much, uh, you know, on the French Revolution. So what we'll do is we'll look at the French Revolution, and then we can look at uh, Napoleon after that. Okay. So, so with that, we'll look at the French revolution and Napoleon next time. Um, and maybe kind of divide, I'm going to figure out how to divide all that up, but French revolution, Napoleon will be our focus area um, going in. Okay. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all so much. I will be back on Monday at one o'clock PM Eastern. And you'll see me again between now and then between social media, Marco learning, uh, Instagram, all of that kind of stuff. But I'll be back for another Corona class on Monday at one o'clock p.m. Eastern. It's always a pleasure.